Well, thank you, Wade, um, for talking today. I think it was you that I first spoke to about this conference. Um, and yeah, it was great. And just also say Wade and I are doing something at the end of January as well on finding talent in the chart, which we'll notify you all about. But um, yeah, that'll be a lot of fun. But back to Wade. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Wade, Wade's been a consultant and educator for um, quite a while now. Um, he um, certified with distinction from the Mayo School, um, which he does um, bits and pieces and tutoring and presenting for. He's also um, a teacher and a bit of director for the School of Traditional Astrology, STA. Um, he does specialize in horary, um, classical and electional astrology techniques, and he's trained in both traditional and modern psychological methods of interpretation. Um, master of many, you know, an expert of many, anything that Wade puts his hand to, he um, does really well. That good Virgo moon researchers and researchers. So it's always great. Um, and he has a passion for understanding the historical and philosophical origins of symbol astrological symbolism and finding reliable ways to use this in, in consultation. So we're really lucky to have him. Um, couldn't have done it without you, Wade. So thank you very, very much. Wow. Um, this is not the oversell of the century. Holy cow. I'm just <laughs> laughing. We write our bios and send these into the organizers. And Wendy just kept adding things in there. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> Well, thank you. I feel very welcome. I'll say that. I feel very welcome and um, I'm excited to be here. I think that this conference is very exciting in theme. I think it's um, it's under discussed, uh, you know, between people who are maybe not really conversant beyond the little sound bites that we've received from um, news cycles. It's an intimidating subject. Um, science is hard. And then when you try to bring astrology into it, most of us go into astrology conferences with a decent handle, but recognizing we always have more to learn. So it's just like learning on top of learning while also really connecting with the material on a, like your own experiential level. So there's just a lot of places where this topic intersects um, with important themes. So I'm excited that this conference is, um, has, you know, been created by um, Wendy and, and her team. So this has been really great. So thank you, Wendy. I just want to say that I had a little bit of nervousness about the material that I wanted to bring in today. Um, not because of, um, mm, let me not dwell on it. I mean, the point is I just didn't know how to present it. It just felt like it was going to be really overwhelming. I didn't know if it was going to be disjointed. Um, and so I was texting somebody who's going to be speaking for you next. Her name is Michael, um, and I just got this response back, this word from encouragement that I want to share with each of you. What Michael said is, I think it's valuable to be generating new thinking and conversation about these ideas. I'm confident you will constellate these examples and questions and observations in ways that spark, spark emergent possibilities for people listening. I love that. Spark emergent possibilities for people listening. And that's the work. I think there's no simple or singular conclusion to reach on the topics of astrology or on climate change, and especially not when linking them together or thinking about them together. So instead, we're making meaning at the interface. So it's just this last bit here about making meaning at the interface that I, I loved. And I, I just thought it would be um, so wrong for um, you know me not to be able to share this beautiful thought about um, you know, the, the exciting opportunity we have to be talking about this subject together that um, I got in this private text from Michael. So I just wanted to share it. And what it also did was help settle me into this realization that I was overthinking my presentation anyway. So I'm just going to talk to you about what I want to talk to you about. I mean, the, the theme that really had, has come into my mind is like, what is astrology's role in these fields that are um, highly technical? Um, and many of us are not, you know, not only not conversant in, in some of the, the, the layers of education you need to be able to show up to some of the, the, the higher versions of the exchanges on these subjects, but, you know, there, there, there is science involved, there's like this, there's whole layers of understanding and learning that, you know, can, it can make it, you know, hard to really access. So like, where do we become valuable in this? And it, you know, I, I think it's, it's not just about climate change, though. I mean, it's about any massive, pressing, serious social issue. It's also kind of came out of thinking about 
jump quickly. <laughs> so I've got um, just a quick, you know, kind of conversation point that I want to make about Joan quickly, just, you know, thinking about ethics and practice when we start stepping into this space, uh, taking a look at social issue, issues, taking a look at political issues, taking a look at emergent issues. Um, as astrologers, you know, what exactly does our role look like? So Joan quickly, there were plenty of photos to choose from, and I found some that I just thought were fantastic. I love this black and white one, and I love the one with her, with her chart wheels in front of her on this desk. She was the um, astrologer to Nancy Reagan, which means that she was um, occasionally employed to advise the Reagan administration on timing for certain initiatives um, and, you know, a sundry list of other things that she would have been looking at as an astrologer in her time. So it was an interesting thing to see, uh, and she timed his inauguration, right? I mean, so like, I, I don't know all the details, I should say, just to be very clear. I'm not really an expert on Joan Quigley. I was in conversation with a friend of mine, Ryan Butler. So he's doing research on Joan and and, um, and I was just gonna mention him on the next slide. Um, and so a lot of this has come up in our conversation. So I'm not an expert on Joan, but what I can tell you is I know that we do have some examples of some work that she's done because um, she doesn't leave a lot of details behind about how she does what she does and when she did it. And, you know, it's it's a little bit more high level than that. And it may be that she just never kept records of these things. And so she's only got a small handful of this, that, the other. All of that's possible because we're talking about the, you know, late 1980s. We don't have email chains that we can scroll back through. So I don't I don't know the details of um, why she left so little behind. But um, this is something she did leave behind. She talked about how um, in November of 1987, she elected a time for Ronald Reagan to nominate Justice Anthony Kennedy for the US Supreme Court. Now this comes at a time where Reagan had nominated two other potential justices and both justices were found, well, they were not confirmed in their position by the US Senate. There was not um, even a lick of bipartisan support the Democrats told, you can see this isn't in the 87, so this is up against 88 was the next election year, and the Democrats told Reagan that his first two selections had been such a joke. If he brings a third that does not receive confirmation, if he brings a third candidate that doesn't receive confirmation, then they wouldn't even sit and have hearings about another candidate until they got the results of the next election. So, you know, I, I think in recent history, we've seen that quite a bit with the Republican Party, but we have to remember that the Democrats use this as a tool as well. So this was a high profile introduction and nomination of this individual. It was the whole nation was paying attention. Um, a lot rode on it for Reagan and his legacy. I mean, Kennedy was, um, you know, his nomination received bipartisan support and he was sworn into new office in February 1988. Only recently did he step down and he stepped down during the Trump presidency and Kavanaugh came in to fill. So, you know, you think about the timing of these kind of moments, um, you know, that the resignations are happening within party owned years to ensure that the replacement, there's like this, you know, kind of continuity in the way that this works. Obviously Reagan was Republican, Trump was Republican. Um, well, what's interesting is that Anthony Kennedy, he had determinative votes in pretty much every matter um, that was important at the time. Um, uh, and, and still continue to be, you know, really major issues that are, you know, not by any means sealed um, or uh, resolved at all. So we've got issues going from, uh, sorry, uh, gun issues, um, abortion, LGBT rights, um, issues related to habeas corpus, um, which is, you know, unlawful detainment um, laws and um, religious liberties, environmental politics and policies, um, capital punishment. I mean, he had his fingers in a lot of pies. And he was an interesting swing vote on a lot of things. This is why he received bipartisan support. So like if you took one issue and he took the typical party stance on this, on the next issue, he would be wildly on the other side and it would just be such a refreshing change. And so I, there was this sense probably from the Democratic Party, you know, I didn't go back and read any of the records from the Senate hearings or what was said at the time, but my guess is that they saw that this is probably the best candidate that they were going to be able to hope for. Their ultimatum worked. They got a candidate that they were happy with. Kennedy received full bipartisan support and he was um, sworn in the next February. So it's a very quick process from November to February from confirmation to being sworn in. I mean, he went through a lot of questions and a lot of you know, uh, interrogation as you would expect, but uh, he came out ahead. Now this is, we 
we do have the details from Jung Quickly about the time that she elected Reagan to announce the inauguration. And the time that she selected was um, 1132 in November, I believe it was the 11th of November of 87. And, um, and what's really fascinating about this chart, uh, on the inside wheel, we've got the nomination. On the outside, we have the birth chart for Justice Kennedy. So we have a Rodden rated AA birth time for Anthony Kennedy, which, um, you know, that was um, very helpful. It's so clear to see what she did. I mean, she took his exact Midheaven degree and had Reagan make the announcement when there wasn't even a minute of arc separation. That's what she, she brought his, his Midheaven, this, the place in the birth chart that talks about our glory, our success, our fame, whatever. She brought that to the Midheaven, or sorry, to the Ascendant. It's a whole bunch of other things that she did in here that were really clever, actually. I thought, you know, as an astrologer, this is, you know, she did probably some very good work here. You can see this Mars-Jupiter opposition perfectly kind of striking that balance of sometimes on one side, sometimes on the other. And I think she made a real personal victory in selecting the moon for the time to be right on his natal Pluto. Now, that is an interesting signature to me. Um, I look at this and I think, I have no opinion that I'm gonna to share today about Justice Kennedy and his decisions and what he had to say. I mean, all I can tell you is that his policies suited both, both the Democratic and Republican platforms in the 1980s. So, um, you know, you can expect that he's gonna more or less rule um, with 1980s ethics. So fine. The thing that's really interesting to me is that what Joan Quigley did as an astrologer was that she took the job that was presented to her, which was get this person in the chair, tell me when I can nominate this individual so that we can get this person confirmed. And she plugged this chart in so well to his birth chart that there would just be this captivation of, of the spirit. Look how the moon is right on his Pluto. It's just this captivating kind of, you know, experience that's drawn the midheaven right on the ascendant. Anybody notice anything though about that Pluto? Um, I want to remind you that this is a justice for the U.S. Supreme Court. Where's the U.S. Pluto? Exactly in opposition, right? At 27 degrees of Capricorn, right? So. You know, and there's other things that I could point out in this, but I think that's like the cleanest and clearest one to see. I, I, I found like really fascinating in this that um, it might be one of these things of, well, was this nomination, she did the job, she got him in, but against the framework, you know, of what we can see um, with the, you know, American chart, was this individual you know, is this, was this the right choice? Should she have supported getting this individual in? Does this actually make sense? It's so, I mean, she, she found herself kind of put in a very interesting position. And um, I'm not even really sure if she thought about it too much. I mean, she had a job, she was asked to do something and she moved forward. But my question is, you know, was that maybe the right thing? Um, I, I found another example of a, a similar kind of issue. This is from years ago that I found this. So this was a, a horary chart in the 1930s um, from an author named Robert Deleuze. I like his book, it's short, it's to the point, um, and he's an interesting read. Um, uses a few interesting techniques that I'm not sure that make a ton of sense um, to me, but um, overall pretty good. He has this chart and here's the background we're provided. The inquirer wishes to know if his suit before a superior judge would have a certain state law declared unconstitutional, you know, whether or not it would be successful. So we have to get a little bit more background on this. So let me go ahead and show you. So in this case, this was written in his text. In this case, the trial had already in occurred and the inquirer wanted to know if the judge would give a decision declaring a certain state law unconstitutional. So what we know is that the court case had already happened. Trial had already occurred. The judgment given by astrology was that the court would blank. I'm not going to tell you because we're going to look at the chart together. About two months after the question was given for judgment, the court rendered a decision that the law in the case was blank 
and hence the Horary figure did correctly foretell the results. But as this case was not simply a personal quarrel between bumptious litigants, but involved a very deep and fundamental principle of law and government, it's necessary to give more than the bare outline above written in order to more fully understand the astrological figure and its interpretation. The state government of California had recently passed a law restricting the waste of natural gas coming from oil wells. This was thought a matter of public policy for the real benefit of the whole community. Nevertheless, certain operators held to the old fashioned theory that property right was inviolable by the legislature. And if a person held legal title to a portion of land, he could waste its resources as he saw fit. Our inquirer, therefore, was of this latter party that opposed the new law. And he, with others of like mind and interest, attacked the validity of the new conservation law in the courts. Behind the law and supporting it were other industri industrial interests that were large enough to obey the law and still get some profit out of the whole thing. And it would be to their advantage to suppress the oil producing activities of the irresponsible and economically limited people who would not be able to commercially market or utilize the natural gas produced by their wells. So it was therefore in the last instance, a fight between large operators and small operators, the small operators standing against the constitutionality of the new law and the new operators upholding the law's validity. Now this to me, um, this is a fascinating situation. Okay, so let's take a look at the chart. So um, the, these small operators, the querents in this kind of, in this horary are signified by the ascendant and its ruler, the moon. So you can see the moon's here in the third house. It's cadent, it's void as well, except just about to enter into a trine with mercury, but it's about four minutes shy before I would consider that being in orb, okay? And then the large operators, the opponents, okay? They are, signified by Saturn. All right, so who do you think wins in this case? Do the small operators or the large operators win just looking at this chart and using your base instinct? Any thoughts? Saturn, right, exactly. Saturn's in its own sign. It's on its own house cusp, it's angular. Okay, and it also has, you know, this, um, the moon's next aspect being to Mercury. Mercury is actually placed within the seventh house as well. I mean, there's, it's, there's not really much that we need to say about this chart, but that's the point, yes, is that the large operators won. And as a result, a lot of very small oil operators had to close because they could not obey the new conservation laws. They, they literally could not afford to obey the new conservation laws. So what this ended up doing was um, concentrating power for more of this resource among fewer hands, which now that begins to set a trajectory towards the kind of voting block and private interest that can stop those very same cons conservation laws from ever entering the books again. Do you, do you see how them winning actually becomes a snake eating its own tail, how this, this situation, it backfires, actually. It, it has a, a long-term trajectory of, of, of problem causing. This is why that's shown by Saturn. It's Saturn dignified. Yes, you know, the, the, it's, it's absolutely the case that this is, you know, kind of a story that is, is progressing, um, you know, among private interest and um, and that also there is going to be the Saturnian theme of disappointment and um, disregard that will be ultimately seen as the legacy of this choice. I mean, the, the fourth house as well, I mean, this is just in California. I think that I'm probably reading a little bit too much into it with what I'm about to say, but the fourth house is the house that shows um, the ultimate legacy of a thing. You know, it's like the final close. We, we, you'll read about it in Hori, Texas, the end of the matter. But when we say the end of the matter, we don't like mean the end of this particular outcome. We mean like, let's look decades beyond and then reassess that moment in time. And what was the real impact that that had? It's like the big picture view. And, um, and that's ruled by Mercury in the seventh house, but look where it is. It's at the tail end of Capricorn. 
Capricorn, which is right where we've got Pluto. It's right where we've got all these kind of stories and themes about, you know, Saturn, Pluto, Jupiter, Pluto, like all these kind of connections at the end of Capricorn, the end of this Earth era moving into the air era. I think it's it's like there's there's this hint, this kiss of a signature in here that suggests that you know this problem will continue to worsen. Um, you know, in the in this version of the problem that's focused on oil um, and oil consumption and oil use um, and waste and things connected to waste and also um, you know oppressing and like cutting off um, at the at the um, source for you know smaller competitors etc that whole theme has just continued so at any rate you know here's my question though like imagine that the horary had actually revealed vulnerabilities in the opposition's position you know would it have been ethical for the astrologer to so advise his client you know that these large because we have to remember at the end of the day this is still a conservation law i mean that's something that we do want to have happen and it's just that there's a way that these kind of things fell out that did not account for the fact that there is an equity among the way that we administer justice. We don't meet people where they are. You, here's the new standard and if you fall below it, I'm so sorry for your luck, we have cut the strings and we will deal with the consequences of that later if they ever show up. Meanwhile, we turn the other direction forever, it seems, and so we never really figure out if there are consequences of you know losing out and I, I think that this story it really reminds me of the sustainability initiatives that have been rolled out on a global level that are expecting you know a certain amount of capital at a nation's disposal to move forward with these objectives we have south american countries for instance who are very clear that if they were to adopt some of the um uh, agreements that have been made you know uh or, or the the recommendations for um waste and waste policy and and um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions is just too expensive. They, they literally can't afford to do it. So where's the support and where's the help going to come from? Um, you know, even the nations that are doing the right thing, <laughs> this is like really sick, the nations that are like doing the right thing, quote unquote, they're, you know, moving to, they're getting their things like the solar panels built in Tunisia letting all the waste collect and collect there and then not actually pumping money into the economy of Tunisia to remove that waste. And so it essentially just looks like Tunisia is continuing to be a problem place where it's actually the waste exportation, you know, this other nation that is having this, you know, lower, um, uh, lower developed uh, nation or, um, you know, essentially pay the bill. So it's, it's a, it's a very kind of interesting dynamic that I don't think We've done a very good job in, you know, expecting transparency about the sourcing of solutions as well, um, and global impact on the way that things are are um, sourced. So, I don't know. It's just something that's kind of on my mind. But I guess the question that I have is like, this is a conservation law that we want, but it's like it kind of felt to me that there was no win. It was like you need to put the law down because it's the right thing, but you also know that we're not prepared to. You know we're not prepared to financially support those who are going to get hurt by it um so we're going to have a problem at the back of this so do we try and stop it you know and and um it's it's an interesting kind of paradox to be in as an astrologer to not you know really have i think probably a tremendous amount of clarity about um where would you proceed under such circumstances it's also possible that robert deluce never saw this man before or again you know so what can you say in 60 minutes with a complete stranger, you know, that can make an impact on the subject this big. I mean, it's it's a, it's an interesting, um, I think, question. And so it just kind of brings it to me, you know, what is the role that we can have as mystics? I mean, I'm just going to, I'm just, you know, really leaning into the use of this word mystics. I think it's become a little bit so far left, you know, to think that it's gotta be, you know, somebody who basically walks around in a fog, follows them, you know, in the stars sparkle when they pass, you know, it's like, Honestly, if you believe all things are connected, that's enough for me. <laughs> we can get to the details later, but if you believe all things are connected, then you're a mystic as well. So like, what does it mean for us to exist in a space where, you know, our way of seeing the world um, is probably very useful to be um, uh, being reminding, you know, to the rest of the world. We want to remind the rest of the world of this way of thinking about this interconnectedness, but if we're not experts, what do we do? 
you know. Um, so what I, I and I also just want to say sometimes when we talk about climate change, we just kind of go in such interesting directions with the conversation. Like I, I know that climate change is a natural part of nature's macro cycles. I know we go through ice ages and warm spells. I, I mean, yes, we know that. The question, one of the questions is whether or not mankind is exacerbating this outside of what humanity is prepared and the rest of the natural world is prepared to tolerate. You know, there is a band at which, you know, over many, many tens of thousands of years, we have grown accustomed to this shift and we can, you know, kind of move through it, but we're making really big assumptions. Um, you know, we've, we've never really had to set roots quite the way that we have recently, of the way that we've built things. Um, you know, are we prepared for um, the way that flooding will will change wildfires tornadoes hurricanes you know our infrastructure planning did not account for these macro cycles even if you don't even if you don't take into account that humankind might be exacerbating the effect the fact is something is definitely happening right now and it's it's moving past what was in our models as infrastructure planners so actually for the rest of this presentation i'm not even sure that i want to really talk about climate change itself it's more about the practicalities of what this means for the rest of us and the reason that i say this is because i'm not in a position to really say or do much about climate change itself i you know i but there are small other things that i can do that add up and make a cumulative effect and also what is climate change it's a summation of a bunch of things happening in collection with each other and so you just have to break this down into things that you can stomach things that you can see and grab after it so what i'm going to do is say that we're going to open up now kind of more of the interactive part of today's of my um, session today so I'm going to ask if you're you know, happy to unmute yourself, you can do that. You can use the chat box. I'll be asking some questions as we move through. Um, I can answer them, but I would be much more interested in the creative thought process that we're going through together because this is I'm going to give you an example of like a practical kind of thing that you can start doing tomorrow. But what I'm doing, just so you know, what I'm doing plays to my strengths. And I want to say that now, because at the end, the point that I'm going to make is and you need to go and think about who you are and what your strengths are and how you can bring astrology into making those more effective in meaningful ways in responding to issues of climate change. Okay, so here we go. So an increase in these type of natural events, okay, any kind of increase, floods, wildfires, rising sea levels, tornadoes, hurricanes, droughts, any of that, it will lead to these sociological crises. And these are just the ones that came to mind at midnight last night to me. I made this slide at midnight. So, I mean, there's going to be so many more things that we could come up with. But just listen to this list. Agricultural emergencies, shipping and supply line disrupt disruption, migration crises, power outages, border closures and international conflict, volatile currencies, strikes, transportation failures, property damage, costly response options, extinctions. All right. As astrologers, I think we're pretty good at seeing the signatures for these things happen. You know, I mean, I think we're, we're fairly good. I mean, if there's a transportation failure, we all know what we should be looking for, right? I mean, if there is a a power outage, we know what we should be looking for. If, if there's something with volatile currencies, there's something we should be looking for. When, when you know, meteorology came around and kicked astrologers out of the, you know, weather prediction side of life, because this is what happens is, you know, we, we were the original weather forecasters, astrologers were, then techni technology outstripped us. And I think it's fair to just say, it's fine. <laughs> the technology outstripped us. But the thing is, what um, meteorology cannot do is also talk like a storm. Here's here's what I'd like to say: a storm can be predicted through any of ten signatures. Okay, you know it could be a Mercury Jupiter conjunction in Leo opposite the Moon. It could be you know anything. It could be any of this. A meteorologist is going to say it's a storm. An astrologer is going to say 
it is a storm of this nature, of this quality. It connects in with the exact same energies in the natural world, which are fueling this crisis here, this crisis here, which means this storm and what it does to the natural world can be taken as metaphorical. If it causes a great amount of damage, other things building on that signature can also be understood to be creating or likely to create a great amount of damage. So there's so many ways in which we should we have lost this knowledge about how to be weather forecasters and i think it has been the gravest mistake that astrologers have we have given up the ability to do weather forecasting and um i almost just like convinced myself right now that i really need to get into this this is probably the most the only time outside of last night is on the phone with Wendy and I said this out loud. This is the first time I'm saying it. I didn't realize how strongly I felt. But anyway, so so the thing is, you know, it's it's this um, you know, importance of connecting in with these kind of symbols that makes that valuable. But let's um let's go ahead and just take a look at um, and this is where we're gonna move into this interactive session. Let's take a look at some of the big planet cycles. Mars moves so quick, I'm only gonna pay attention to the conjunctions with Mars. Um, and then with the others, I'll pay attention to the hard aspects of the conjunctions and the squares, oppositions, etc. But I just want to walk through each of these and just say, okay, this is what's coming in 2022. So what kind of crises do they fit well with? So that's where I just want to start. So let's say Mars Pluto. What kind of crisis does that sound like a Mars Pluto crisis? First thing I think of is like, um, power outages. Think. What other crises do you think with Mars Pluto? Oh, it's crickets. Okay. Nobody's got anything. Wow, I'm so, I'm shocked. I thought somebody would have something. All right, so with Mars Pluto, I'm thinking we're, we could easily be talking about power outages, anything connected to like labor strikes. Um, we've got people who are saying potentially, you know, some financial issues. I think when Pluto gets any kind of hit with Mars, yeah, there might be spikes or things that happen with, um, you know, things uh, maybe volatile currencies or anything in the, um, um, you know, wealth circle. What about Mars Saturn? I think about transportation issues a lot. Um, a lot of transportation is built on um, a lot of steel. Um, and you know, somebody made the point to me that trains, for instance, are just giant metal barrels on rails. You know, they they are the, as Saturn as you can get while still getting confused for Mercury. <laughs> you know, so there's something very strong this attorney about the rail industry and and um, uh, and transportation in general. I think with Mars Saturn, you might also be looking at um, Migration crises, yeah, that seems like a possible. What about um, Jupiter Neptune? What about Jupiter Neptune? That's going to happen in Pisces as well. This one to me feels so obvious. I, I flooding, yes, Susan. That's exactly what I think. I think that you know we're taking a look at a period where we can probably expect a great amount of flooding. Um, I think probably, yeah, somebody says confusion. So we got to figure out what the crisis actually looks like. Um, migration issues, yes. I absolutely think Neptune has got a connection with migration, spread, flooding, refugees. That makes a great deal of sense to me. Um, and I, and you know, I would also say with when we talk about migration and refugees, it's sometimes those are war related, but sometimes they're economic. And sometimes I, I, you can very often trace that there may be some kind of climate effect um, that's relating back. So with these migrant crises, the ones that I'm kind of talking about here are ones that result from, you know, agricultural or economic issues. Um, let's see. Um, issues with oil and gas. Perfect. And I just want to say, Leanne, I don't know if you know, your, your messages are coming only directly to me, which is fine, but I don't know if you want the rest of the group to see. Um, they won't have seen what you're saying. But um, everyone mixing again, yeah, possibly. So that could be leading back to um, pandemic. You know, there's a possibility of that mixing. Issues with oil and gas. Yes, absolutely, oil and gas. Okay, what about Mars Neptune? I won't lie, this one's a little bit harder for me. Those energies just seem so um, different. Um, potential for explosions, that's an interesting one. Gas leaks, I wonder if it's appropriate to think about oil spills. Tornadoes, that's such a good one, Wendy. 
Wow, that's really, yeah, that's such a good one, tornadoes. Um, what about Mars, Jupiter? Yep, rising sea levels with, yep, Mars, yep. Mm -hmm. Mars, Jupiter, I think about strikes a lot. I think about fires, wildfires with um, Mars, Jupiter. Um, I think agricultural emergencies with Mars, Jupiter. Um, Mars, Saturn as well, probably could have thrown that out there. Um, what about Mars, Uranus? Yeah, that could be war. You have to remember that Mars makes a hard contact to Uranus every two years. So, or sorry, about every six months, I mean to say. So um, yeah, I think accidents are probably the most likely thing. I mean, this is gonna be one of those things where, you know, when and where it coincides with other things that are happening, it will just, yes, disconnection from iron and steel. I, that's really good. Mars Uranus does show up in, in uh, rail accidents frequently. Um, so at any rate, you know, you can just, move through you know these different kind of ideas and and start to map out you know as an astrologer what does this sound like what like if i was looking at this in review what kind of problems would i've been like oh yeah well of course that happened because so this is your you're you're trying to build your um your pre um I don't want to say that not predictive, proactive. That's the word I'm looking for. Proactive muscle with the um the the, the work with these symbols. What about Jupiter Pluto? We haven't talked about Jupiter Pluto yet. <sighs> that one's interesting to me. Um that looks like currency volatility to me. I think that's gonna be a crypto something. Um Pluto will be retrograde at zero Aquarius. You know, you have to also um, remember that zero degrees of the signs, it's where the energy is absolutely at its strongest and then it dissipates as it moves through the next 30 degrees. Um, you know, it's kind of like um, everything's so exciting when you get to Italy on the first day, but by the 30th day, you know, you might be ready for your next country or whatever. You know, so the idea is like you, um, um, it's so much stronger in the beginning. So somebody said, I don't know what a Python is. I'm so sorry. I have no idea what that is. Um, okay, so I, I think currency is probably at least we can, you know, think about that. Um, probably agricultural. Whenever, yeah, there's there's some. Okay, waterland food issues. That's yeah, that's that's an that's an interesting one. 2024, we've got a lot of um, you know similar contacts going on. Let's just take a look at the ones that are different, the ones that are new. We've got Jupiter Uranus. What about Jupiter Uranus? What do you think about that? I think wildfires, because I think about lightning strikes. All I can think about when I see that is lightning strikes and maybe explosions as well. Well, really the thing is Jupiter makes everything that it touches touch. Yes, earthquakes, I also exactly because it's in Taurus. Um, that feels really appropriate in Uranus. Yeah, famine. Well, that's interesting. Ooh, that's, that's interesting. There could also be a fertility crisis of some kind. But the thing is Jupiter um, your, or some, um, yeah, hmm. I'm just thinking on that. Earth technologies. Hmm. What about Jupiter Saturn? So that's this is interesting because this is across Gemini Pisces. This Jupiter Saturn square. It's at 17 degrees. Okay, Saturn's retrograde at 17 degrees of Pisces. Jupiter's at 17 degrees of Gemini. Um, this is a this particular square is a reflection of the positions that Saturn and Jupiter were during the OJ Simpson trial. So we're going through a Saturn return of that trial. If you are not aware, Saturn was in Pisces during that trial. It was at like around like I think it's around like fourteen degrees of Pisces, something like this. Okay, so it's like in the Earth, like it's in Pisces, and interestingly, Jupiter is at like 18 degrees of Sagittarius, or it's just on the other side. It's on, so what ends up happening is we've still got Saturn in Pisces, but in the OJ trial, it was in Sag, and now it's in Gemini, but either way, there's a square. So I think part of whatever I'm gonna include with Jupiter Saturn squares is some potential decision related to the justice community that has, I, I, I just said justice community, that was a crazy thing to say, like, Justice departments um, that has long reaching effects, you know, Saturnian type effects. Wendy says holograms. So, yeah, okay, listen, the point in bringing all this up, I mean, and, and then there's all this like Jupiter, Saturn, Jupiter, Neptune, Saturn, Neptune. We don't have to go through all the different permutations of the different things that are coming up. 
what you want to do, or at least what I'm kind of, you know, pointing out and, and drawing a finger toward is to show that what we start with is just take a look at what we know, start with the astrology and work backwards. Because the thing is, um, all these things are going to happen eventually. The floods will happen, the wildfires will happen, hurricanes will happen. If it's possible um, in your uh, ecological reality, in your environment where you are, then it will happen. And if it's not possible, it might start becoming possible. <laughs> you know, it just snowed in Hawaii, um, which is just crazy. So at any rate, um, you know, there's, um, we, you're not going to go wrong if you focus on the wrong issue. But what you do is you start with the broader cycles and say, well, where am I seeing a theme? And where am I seeing a theme that relates to where I am? So let me tell you a little bit about where I am. I live in New York City. It is the rat capital of the world. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, I, I love living here. I live in Brooklyn. Last year, or this, this, this past year, we had some incredible floods. We had some incredible storms moving through the Northeast. That Did any of you see any of the videos of the floods from that time? Just the entire subway stations that are just um, filled. It looks like that scene from Titanic when Rose was getting down to the, the final place to go get Jack while he was handcuffed, like, and the water was up to her neck. Like, that's what the subway stations looked like. Right, Heidi said they were getting six inches of rain in New Jersey. I mean, it was insane. It was just, and what we realized is the city just did not have the ability to flush out that much water quickly enough. So what I know is that in New York City, th there is a particular susceptibility we have to weather-related events that touch on themes related to rain, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do now, I, I know that um, that's an issue. And I also know that transportation's an issue. So I might then start to take a look at what are all the things that look to me like they are connecting into the potential um, for rains, for bad rains, um, for flooding, uh, and for anything touching transportation in some kind of difficult way. So I'll just like pull some of these and take a look at the individual charts about how they kind of lay out in, um, in New York. See if there's anything else I can get off the back of that. Sometimes there isn't, sometimes it's just fine. I understand that these things are just gonna come in a succession um, here over the next few years. And so I realize that, you know, there is, um, there are benchmarks here that we've been using to track our progress. So it might move from there to me deciding to start taking a more active role in seeing how my city is planning to prepare for these crises. So this is, Again, as the astrologer, you have the confirmation that this is coming. You know, we have the technological side that shows this is coming, but the technological side, um, you know, it, it's it, we can marry these kind of realities together. We have the astrological confirmation coming, giving us a sense that this may happen sooner than we realize, right? This can happen and materialize sooner than we realize. So we need to be prepared. Now in New York City, um, in March and April of every year, the city council holds public hearings um, on a preliminary version of the budget that's presented from the mayor in January. And the version of this budget, it reflects the mayor's priorities and the mayor's goals for the years ahead. So the plan is at this stage that it's most malleable because whatever the mayor wants to do, there's still gonna be many layers of review. It's the mayor's budget to approve, but the city council also has to put in writing their recommendations, which includes saying, you know, you and, and they did this last year, you know, you didn't give any money for, you know, child care, and we really need these services about child care to continue. So Mayor de Blasio needed to put that back in. So it is very much a, we can talk about just about anything as we move through. Now, what I know is that, um, you know, as I'm taking a look here, I can see that it's March and April that the hearings are happening. So I'm t I just kind of, I know that the Aries ingress happens in the middle of this period. So I can only imagine that if it's such an astronomically important event is happening in the middle of a budget process for a whole city, um, then this chart's gonna be really important. You know, do you see in this any themes reinforcing the importance of preparation for rains and floods? This is the Aries ingress for next year for New York City. Do you see anything about rains and floods here? Pisces on the midheaven, yeah, but not just Pisces in the midheaven. Look at Neptune, Jupiter, Mercury, all of them in Pisces. 
all of them conjunct. Mercury's moving toward the ruler of um, Pisces. Mercury rules the ascendant, which shows the actual people. Mercury rules the fourth house, which shows the property and the land. Mercury rules both, and it's in Pisces right up at the top. Okay. Um, Wendy's also shared that there's this moon handle on the buck on a, a bucket shape. That's the one, you know, this is why you know, it's always good to have Wendy in the room because I would not have picked up on something like that. So, yep, there's the you know, moon bucket. But where's the moon heading next? Into a water sign to then trine the Pisces midheaven and all of this. So I can get the astrological confirmation I need that there's two things that are going to be very useful for me in this year. Because Neptune, Jupiter, and Mercury are all in the 10th house in Pisces, and the 10th house rules um, politicians and leaders and people who are in a position to you know, have some degree of authority over you. Having these planets in the tent suggests that they are very ready to listen to anything touching on this theme. Does that make sense? There's so, because it's brought to an angle, I can probably guess actually that a lot of people will probably have this to say. This will probably be something that comes up frequently. I probably don't need actually to mention. But the signatures also suggest <laughs> that even still, we're gonna get hit by some really hard rains this year and it's gonna be a very prescient conversation for throughout the next year. I'm very much prepared for it to be a very wet summer, a very, very wet summer. Leanne's also commented, um, these Aquarius planets carrying water, it comes from the sky. So we have all these like water related planets right above the midheaven. It's an interesting connection, Leanne. So this is just the Aries ingress. I'm just getting some kind of astrological confirmation that, yeah, like this, this is the general theme of the thing that we as a city need to focus on. It's very important. And maybe what I find is that there is a, um, a hearing that's taking place on the 3rd of April that I'm actually able to attend. And this is where I want to go and I want to give some form of testimony. And so I want to know, you know, how can I be most effective in delivering my encouragement for more investment on flood preparation. Do you see what I'm saying so far? Like we're starting with just the general theme of the broad cycles. We're narrowing it down to what's happening this year. Now we're taking a look at the lunation that's coming just before the hearing that I'm going to attend. So we're starting with the big cycles and we're getting closer and closer in. I've got the lunation just before this hearing that I might go attend, and this is where I'm going to go talk to the city council about what I'd like to see changed about the budget. What do you notice about this chart? This is going to tell me, you know, about the, you know, the mentality of, you know, how, how things are feeling right now. So I want to take some meaning out of this and make sure that I incorporate it in my strategy. Crowded lower hemisphere. Yep, perfect. Laura, that was great. All squashed in the first quadrant. What house is it in? All in that second house. Do you see that? There's so much second. Yeah. So what do you think this tells me? There are one, two, three, four, five planets all fighting with each other. I'll tell you what this tells me. <laughs> this tells me, you know, that there are many different people fighting for this money. You know, there's a lot of different influences trying to fight for the money. But who's closest to the second house cusp? Mars and Saturn. Now, who does that sound like? Who, who in a city budget is fed by Mars or, or shown by Mars? And who does in a city budget Saturn sound like? You know, to me, I think Mars, I think police. And then Saturn, I think probably you'd be looking at, um, you know, people who occupy bureaucratic ranks within city organization, okay? So those are the two where I think most of the investment is going. Then there's this Venus aspect, which is probably a bit more on the social justice element. And then all the way back, it doesn't look like it because of the way this chart is drawn, but Pisces is intercepted here. I mean, there is a full almost 30 degrees between Venus and Jupiter. So what this tells me is that even though everyone recognizes that flooding is important, even when I come into this lunation, there still is not enough funding. Police are getting a lot. The city is getting a lot. These charitable causes, social justice issues, um, giving, setting up social programs, things that fall under the Venusian type category in an air sign, those are getting some good 
good money. And that's all great, fine, you know? I mean, not that I don't know if I agree with the police side, but we need to push Jupiter up. And I also know that what happens is when all these planets are constricted, they're all basically within a square of one another. I mean, if you, I, I'm gonna have to discount Pluto here, but you know, between Uranus to Mars, I mean, that's all within the space of 90 degrees. So to me, it just feels like everybody feels stuck. Everybody wants money, but they don't know how to offload it. You know, and so it's like, you can't, we can't just like keep adding zeros to the bill. We have to move money around on a page at this point. So fine, this chart actually would give me a perfect strategy for how I would tackle this issue. Um, now I'm gonna tell you what that strategy is based on this astrology, and it may or may not be something that I actually use at some point in the future, but I'm just going to you know, tell you. If I take a look at Mars conjunct Saturn, for instance, what I'm already getting an image of is people who use force in their in their occupation. So it's possible a lot, and I sorry, maybe it was Priscilla said firefighters might be shown by that Mars. Um, I'm just taking police, I think is where I'm, I'm focusing on the Mars aspect of things. And with that, um, Mars in the second house, what I know is that a lot of money is going toward that Mars. Now I happen to used to work um, with um, government offices before. And so I'm aware of what kind of reporting is available. This tells me that I probably can, what I need to do is move budget outside Okay, we need to move budget outside of the police department and move it somewhere else. Fine. Probably what this is going to need to look like is, you know, if 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 you take a look at the like where the money is actually going, so much of it is actually overtime for police. There, are, I, I I don't have the figure. I, I I did actually want to have that for this discussion just to give you guys a sense of scale of what we're talking about. But it, you know, it dawned on me when I was looking at the financial report of this because I then I started thinking to myself, well, listen, I, I see what the police budget is, but I need to know how they're spending that money. So I'm just slowing down and saying I need to know how they spend that money. So then I go look up a second report about how over the last few years the police have spent their money. It is an exorbitant amount. A percent of their payroll is actually spent on overtime. And this is the one job I could provide study after study after study that shows that decision quality steadily erodes the longer that you work. And I don't think somebody who's got a gun on their hip or has the power to keep somebody behind bars should be working 12 hour days. You know, so there's just this, um, you know, I, we, we, I could take that comment so much further, but perhaps we could agree that we need to protect the mental health of these individuals who are in these roles. <laughs> you know, so let's start there. So what if it was just a discussion of, we're not asking you to cut anybody in the police force, but we are asking you to say no more overtime. You know, how would your organization need to change to accommodate that? And then suddenly look at all the capital that you've freed up, you know, and so you can start to move things in different directions. So th these are the ways that, you know, I would look at a chart like this using my particular strengths. I used to be a financial analyst, so I'm very comfortable looking at financial reports. I used to work in um, transportation infrastructure. I'm very comfortable with transportation infrastructure and having conversations about um, that world where the money is needed and where it's not needed. So I'm playing to my strengths. You're going to have to, you know, turn around and, and find what yours are. I want to give you an example. Can I can I just pause and say, are there any questions at this stage? Would would you say that it's making sense? Um, never really presented, you know. Definitely you know, making it. sense. Yes, definitely. Okay, awesome. Um, are there any questions at this stage? Um, okay, so um, Joellen has, I'm, I hope I've said your name correctly, I'm so sorry. So business public services overwork overloads will cause a disruption to operate. I mean, yeah, I think that's, that's definitely a point that you could make in that kind of conversation, but you have to understand like, I can be like, if I wanna take money off of anybody, I know that I can almost always look at labor first because I used to manage businesses so the thing is I'm jumping like leaps ahead and I'm making it seem like these solutions should seem obvious to the average person I'm not suggesting that that's the case like I said I'm playing to my strengths I know that most organizations spend their money on like um you know loss like risk aversion and they spend their money on maintenance and they spend their money on labor those are the big things so if you can you know get in there and understand which of these has the biggest problem you can free up some capital without really changing almost anything. So um, I don't have auburn hair. Sorry if you're asking me, it's just the sunlight, you know. Um, so um, let me um, go ahead. Um, oh, Jolene, okay, 
well, I know Dolly Parton. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you, don't, you don't have to worry about that. I want to tell you guys a little bit about a developing story that I'm um, that I'm tracking and I'm finding very, very interesting. And um, I just want to share with you that sometimes a situation may also be too big. I'm a really big believer in stop trying to fix the nation. Just focus on your own town. First of all, all right, you start with yourself and you start with your family and your home and your neighborhood and your city and you stop when you get overwhelmed. <laughs> like if you can, you know, and if you can move your way up to working through county or regional support, then fantastic. You can take on those kind of responsibilities. But I think we all have been taught to focus so far outward that we forget how much is lost in the immediate ground. This is where the battle's really taking place. So that's why my example is about looking at the city budget. I would also like to say that the example of looking at city budgets is, was not my own. It was, um, it was something that uh, in speaking with Michael, they, they look at um, city budgets on a regular basis. And, and we spoke last year during the time when Michael's looking at um, the city budget for where they live. And we had a really productive conversation about it. And I thought, you know, I don't know why I've never thought to look at it. And with the express purpose of providing an opinion. So that was such a, um, an eye-opening, like, oh my God, why had it not occurred to me that I have every right to decide that I don't want my police working on overtime. I'm paying their bills. So like I have every right to voice that perspective. And if I, that means that it allows me to suggest that that money gets shifted into other places that I believe we need to focus, I have every right to do that too. So it's just, you know, it's, it was a very liberating kind of experience. I just want to thank Michael for that and make sure that Michael gets credit for, um, you know, being an introducer of that, that idea. But there is when, you know, I do also like to look at, you know, big stories because I, I find them to be very useful. So there's this story that's happening on the federal level that I think is very interesting that I'd like to walk you all through. Can I get a time check though? Am I, am I right that I have about... You have about 15 minutes? Perfect, because I think what I will do is I will walk through this in about five to 10, probably 10, and then open it up for questions. Perfect. Um, Cool. All right. That's that's really great. So in November, Biden signed this infrastructure bill, which I'm excited about. You say the word infrastructure to me and, you know, I'm just like, you know, I'm right there with you. Like, let's talk about it. And this bill is very exciting because of what it's supposed to do. Um, and there is a lot of money behind it, a lot of money behind it. Um, I'm seeing Kim says that I've got 30 minutes. I'll let you guys figure that out. I, either way, I can be fine because we can- Oh, I'm sorry. Time. Yes, yes, yes. It's 30 minutes. I'm sorry, Wade. I'm thinking to- Good, then past. I won't rush through this bit because then- No, I, no, I no, no. You've got to half past. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Kim. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you, Kim. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so, so let me just walk through- through this, that there's billions of dollars of behind, tens of billions, maybe even hundreds. I, I actually did not get the, the full number because I'm looking at sections of the whole infrastructure bill. I haven't looked at, you know, the whole thing together. It's a lot, you know, there's a lot in there. It's, it's you know, a multi-decade initiative. I think it's, you know, most of it's probably supposed to happen in the next 10 years, but it's a multi-decade initiative. Um, and according to the um, Office of the President, here is what this bill is meant to do. So that on their website, it says this historic legislation will, and they give all these bullet points and then they provide a whole paragraph of explanation. Um, I cut out the paragraph of explanation because for the purposes of our discussion, we just need to talk about the high level initiative. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because I want you to hear and listen how much climate is brought into this. So first is this historic legislation will deliver clean water to all American families and eliminate the nation's lead service lines. Massively um, important. We still have whole cities and communities that do not have fresh drinking water. It's unthinkable. We knew about this back in 2015. We knew about it earlier. It's insane. I'm just 2015. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you remember in the um, 2016 election, um, both um, Clinton and Trump used it as a speaking point that they, the first thing they were going to do is wave a magic wand and, and fix Flint. And as soon as Hillary didn't win, she never talked about Flint again. And as soon as Trump won, he, um, <laughs> 
did what he did. So the thing is, um, Flint is still without clean water to this day. I mean, it's just insane. And that's in Michigan. All right, so deliver clean water, get rid of lead service lines, ensure every American has access to reliable high-speed internet, Wendy. So that connects in with the comment that um, you had made about uh, you know this these these movements into air signs, um, repair and rebuild our roads and bridges with the focus on climate change mitigation, resilience, equity, and safety for all users. So to translate this, what we're talking about climate change mitigation. Okay, well you know you can't have um, rivers overflowing and then flooding a major service line that you know cuts through city and county and then service line disruption happens and we've got supply chain issues. Um, you also can't have bridges um, that are deteriorating because of extreme weather events. Um, there are current bridges in the nation that are held together through honestly nothing more than zip ties. American state of infrastructure is in, is very sad state, um, particularly where roads and bridges are concerned. There's also a mention of improving transportation options for millions of Americans and reduce greenhouse emissions through the largest investment in public transit in U.S. history. Okay, it all sounds good. Let's keep moving. Um, upgrade our nation's airports and ports to strengthen our supply chains and prevent disruptions that have caused inflation. Um, this will improve U.S. competitiveness, create more and better jobs in these hubs, and reduce emissions. Um, make the largest investment in passenger rail since the creation of Amtrak. So this is, I'm just going to park this because this is the one line in this that we're going to really investigate. Um, build a national network of EV chargers for electronic vehicles. Um, upgrade our power infrastructure to deliver clean, reliable energy across the country and deploy cutting edge energy technology to achieve a zero emissions future. Make our infrastructure resilient against the impacts of climate change, cyber attacks and extreme weather events, and then deliver the largest investment in tackling legacy pollution in American history. So this is about Superfund and brownfield sites, abandoned mines, orphaned oil wells, etc. Okay, so this whole thing, you know, there's a lot of money pumped behind this until you start to realize how much is we're trying to accomplish. Probably that entire budget could accomplish one of these things well. So I, I want to say that, <laughs> that this is, um, it's really exceptional that this money is going specifically toward infrastructure. But here's what I also know, you know, I used to work in infrastructure consulting. Does anybody know what the consulting labor cost is? Um, as opposed to the average labor cost in for an employee of an organization. So say for instance, that um, I manage a, um, a, 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 a um, train station. So I'm a train operator and I've got, I own this station, but I don't own the maintenance crew. I've got a contract that work out. On average, you pay somewhere between 2.2 to 3.5 times more than you would if you had that same expertise in house. So you can already, wherever that financial, financial component is going to labor, whatever part of that is going to labor, um, it's already going to be about 2.2 um, to 3.2 um, or something like this uh, times too much. You know, it's, it, there's too much money being spent um, on, on it, it's too much per hour, essentially, is what this comes down to. It's not an effective way of spending to, to contract all this work out. I know this. I used to make very good money off of, um, you know, departments of transportation have to hiring me in at three times what they would pay anybody else just to have me say, yes, I think your plan is good, <laughs> you know, or to help them shift. And of course, I mean, I'm joking a little bit. We did some really good work, and I think it was very useful. But I, I mean, at every step of the way, I just thought you could also just hire me. You know, and we can just do this here. I don't understand why you feel like you have to pay three times as much. You can just hire us. Um, you could hire three of me for the amount you're paying for me. So I just don't, I, you know, it's very confusing. Now, the situation with Amtrak. First of all, before we do this, how does this chart feel to you guys? This is the time that Biden signed the infrastructure bill. Jolene loves it. I take it that, are you excited about the Uranus? on the ascendant. I, I'm somewhat mitigated against excitement for that in the recognition that there's an applying opposition from Mars. Um, and, um, oh, you're so sweet, you're so sweet. And this square to Saturn and this square between the moon and Venus, 
okay? Um, and the square between the sun and Jupiter. I'm gonna to explain to you why these things make me nervous. I'm not gonna leave you in the lurch. I'm gonna walk you through things that have actually already happened. Um, yeah, let's just jump into, I'm trying to figure out, this is what I'm saying is like the order of how to present this is I just need to work on this. Let me just start by saying, what has been suggested is that we are going to give tens of billions of dollars to Amtrak, which is a for-profit company, which gets to operate like a publicly trade, like a public company rather, that it's owned by the public, because it receives, this, it receives so much in transportation subsidies, okay, um, from the US government. So it acts like a quasi-public body, but it is entirely private and it is a for-profit organization. Um, I want you to just have a look at the astrology of this organization as well. Um, yeah, Wendy says, ouch, is there something in particular that you're seeing? So I'll tell you just quickly, this chart is for when Amtrak commences operations. We used to run a bunch of different train lines, then we created Union Pacific, okay, Union Pacific. And then, um, uh, and then Union Pacific became Amtrak, and the first service that was operated was on the 1st of May, 1971, 12.01 a.m., so just past midnight was the first service operation in Washington, D.C., okay? And it was leaving Washington, D.C. So this is the commencement chart of this new organization, all right? So there's some pretty tough astrology in this chart on their own, right? Um, but I just want to also kind of tell you that a huge part of the issue with this organization um, is that they have really um, done a terrible job at managing their own infrastructure, partially because of what I've already explained. When it's a for-profit model, we try to drive down the cost of labor. So what they did was they contracted a lot of their maintenance work out. They contracted as much out as they could. They kept as trim as they could. They subsidized, subsidized a lot of this maintenance work with government funding, okay? And then they contracted that out. So within Amtrak's own house, there, is, there are limited pockets of knowledge about how the whole system actually works. Legacy knowledge about the whole system is here and there. You know, this is the issue with mix, mixing private organization of public interest is that the private interest is not matching what actually makes the public, because this is a service. Train delivery, transportation is a service. Um, but when it's public, it's a commercial enterprise. So there's already this kind of like, we do not have the same. But Amtrak, it really, you know, um, deteriorated in quality. It's a joke now. It's a, it's a national joke, Amtrak is. And it can be fun to be on an Amtrak line. And every now and again, you can get a good train on a good line with good service. But they're almost always late. The, you know, it's, it's the, the trains very often feel run down. Take a look. Amtrak is specifically named in this infrastructure bill as where this money is going to go. And part of Amtrak's um, mandate is that they are meant to also make sure that they are addressing the vulnerabilities that their track system has to um, global warming and to flooding in particular. So if I was going to show you a map of the Northeast Corridor, so this is, you know, Boston, New York City, Philadelphia, DC, major metropolitan areas in the US that there are with just a little bit of a rise in sea levels or excessive rains, the floodplains extend over these train lines and now these supply lines become inoperable Then we can't use them, um, um, or at least not with the same level of safety and expectation that we might've had before. So now we're expecting Amtrak one to do the job. First of all, we're asking them not only to catch up because there is decades of backlog of maintenance issues that they already cannot afford to do. Okay, so we're asking them to take these billions, which is not enough to do all of the future renovations anyway, not only to catch up on their backlog, but also take a leap forward at the same time. So I'm just gonna tell you there's not enough capital for what is being asked of Amtrak. And also it doesn't have the right leadership just between you and me and literally anybody who will ask me. But here's what's fascinating. You know, they, they, they made this kind of, um, this jump, I want to point this out to you that, and I'll just use this infrastructure bill. When we contract out labor, you can always see that by the sixth ruler. Come on. 
by the sixth ruler being somehow related to the seventh or the eighth. Okay, that shows an out contract of labor. And that's really what this whole bill is. It's just a, a giant request for proposals from every consulting firm, every engineering firm, every government, you know, like show us how you'd spend these, this money. You know, even still with, with this much money on the table, there's not really a cohesive plan. We're hoping people will come to us with a good plan and then we get to choose where that money is spent. You know, there's not a, if anybody convinced you that there's like a plan that we're going after, there is no plan. There is a broad idea about what we'd like to see happen. And then what's gonna happen is Amtrak is gonna say, who can help us build this? And it's going to be about farming this out, paying way more than we need to, right? But then also as that kind of stuff comes in, um, this plan may be disjointed from what happens five years from now when there's a change of leadership at the Amtrak or organization. So there now seems to be a conflict and these plans don't work together because there's no grand plan. It's all being kind of handled in this, you know, you know, super managed way. So what I find really interesting is, you know, this overlay and configuration. I wanted to show you, um, take a look at the fact that Amtrak's Pluto is right on the sixth house cusp, exactly. You can also see that the moon Mars opposition that Amtrak has falls exactly on the US Pluto and the MCIC axis of this infrastructure bill. Now, what's a really interesting thing that's going to come up is what's going to happen at 23 degrees of fixed signs, 23 degrees of fixed signs. This is going to come up repeatedly as we move through the next few slides that these really, really tough things that are, are coming up will include hard aspects to these degrees. And this is fascinating to me because this degree of 22 degrees Taurus I'm so sorry, I'm trying to find, there it goes, 22 degrees Taurus. This was the 19, or sorry, the 2000, the May 2000 Saturn-Jupiter conjunction, the last one in Earth signs. So it's almost like this square is setting up, because this is when there was a major decline in, um, in, or, or a, a, a reinvestment in Amtrak after a major decline was in 2000. There was you know, more money, but even still, there was feedback that it was mismanaged, that we were unhappy with the results and a cascading you know, failure of leadership that was happening all over the place. People quitting and, and um, you know, leaders changing repeatedly. I mean, it's just exactly what you expect. Now, I now have, the by wheel here between these so you can see more clearly if the inside is the infrastructure bill that biden signed okay remember so here's the infrastructure bill pluto right on the midheaven the moon at 15 aries pluto on the midheaven the moon at 15 aries on the outside is amtrak's natal chart okay so this to me i mean this is wild sun uranus all opposite mars okay um, Pluto right on the sixth house cusp. This Mars Moon opposition showing a you know problem of competing interest between private and public partnership. Okay, the Sun. All right, so we know where the next square has to be. It's got to be here. You know that's where it's going to all kind of come together. What I what I wanted to point out to you is this issue of the privatization of rail. It's already impacted Europe. In 1991, there was a directive that was signed by the EU um, called, it was Directive 440. And it was basically inviting private um, commercial interests in rail. And the idea was to get Britain, or sorry, uh, Europe to be more interconnected. Well, Britain took this and said, well, now we can privatize um, our rail service. And so I believe it was called rail track is what it turned into, but there was, um, you know, so it, there was, um, you know, this movement into the private privatization of rail. Now at this stage, because of what had gone on with Margaret Thatcher, we had already started selling the repair yard, shipyard. I mean, we, so much, it was the stations themselves and the track still was under public ownership, but basically everything else was already privately owned. It was like sold piecemeal. Okay, so you can hear the fracturing, the problem that you would get with fracturing. Okay. And um, 
finally, the, the actual track itself was then sold. And um, now you've got multiple owners all trying to collaborate together to you know, bring this story um, into. Now, this is the lunation. I can't get the actual time of signing. I can give you the, the date that it was signed, but I can't get the actual date of the signing of this um, directive. But I can show you the lunation before it and take a look at this. Do you see that moon Saturn opposite the sun? This is when it's based in London. So how did this impact the UK? Okay, because there was, um, you know, this really nasty, you've got Uranus on the ascendant. Oh, isn't that familiar? Uranus on the ascendant, moon Saturn. Look at this, this you know, Saturn return to the same position. Okay, it's interesting. Um, I also found really fascinating that 14 degrees of Gemini is on the sixth cusp. The problem that we ended up having as a result of this directive was that there was no institutional knowledge. We contracted the labor out to so many different parties that the organizing bodies responsible um, for their own, um, the organizing bodies responsible for you know, their own section of the whole story, whether you manage the track, you manage the, the shipyard or the parts yard or whatever. Um, you know, there, there was not a consistent understanding about how all these pieces fit together and what, you know, maintenance and pass off looks like between these organizations um, and maintenance deteriorated. It didn't even take very long. It didn't even take very long. Maintenance deteriorated. And we had two of the worst crashes, worst peacetime disasters, the Hatfield rail crash. How many of you in the audience remember the Hatfield rail crash? That was in 2000. And then two years later, there was the Potter's Barn crash. Look at this. This crack, first of all, there was a fault with the actual track itself that was detected a year earlier. An engineer said, there's a problem. But because of the way that everything had been fractured, there was no way to get that information up into the right hands. And so we knew and sat on this problem. And what's really fascinating to me, um, if you take a look, you can see that the sixth ruler, Venus is in the 12th, showing that it is our fault, you know, essentially, of you know, the hiring that we've done here in opposition to Saturn coming to collect the recompense for the mistake that was done. And the moon and descendant are exactly on the sixth cusp um, and in square to Mars, which is also in square to the ascent. I mean, it's just all over the place. And if you take a look at the accident that happened two years later, Potter's Bar, it's the exact same thing. It's, it's showing that the sixth ruler is in a damaging place. And as a result, what's happened is this labor is, so I'm paying very close attention to this because I am nervous about the way that I am tracked. All the signatures are pointing to the same exact disaster. And I don't know, you know, how does this, you know, interact with climate change necessarily? I mean, what I, what I think that I, I can imagine what this does, and this is why I get nervous about it, is it will put so much money into recovery. I mean, the UK, has now recently entered into discussion again about bringing all the rail because of these accidents and everything happened coming out of austerity to bring them black back under public ownership. So now you have network rail, you know, and, and slowly beginning to accumulate, um, you know, all these, um, you know, different organizations into one, you know, in-house kind of body that's under public ownership and public stewardship, which is fantastic. Um, we're moving it, you know, it's 20 years on and we're just walking into the story that you guys had in the early 2000s. So I'm, I am in many ways disappointed, <laughs> but not surprised. You know, this is just exactly what I would expect. Um, but, you know, this is the thing about Uranus retrograde, you know, enshrined this position here. I mean, there's just something about, we just, we have to relive this in some way. We have to relive this story over here and, and figure out our own lesson. Um, but there is, you know, this, this recognition that when this hits communities, we need to recognition that, um, you know, it's probably going to be marginalized communities that are going to have the hardest hit on the back of this because we have this really hard condition between the 10th and the 4th house with this moon Mars opposition. And also a recognition that there's new introductory elements of all the things that can go wrong. This chart is telling us that something will go wrong contract connected to contracting work out. Right. But now, you know, if we start to take a look at, well, what could that possibly, what could it be pointing to? What could it be trying to say might you know, be part of the equation? All the maps related to flooding connect into this as well. It's wild. Take a look at this. So I'm just going to show you now. So on the inner wheel now, I'm showing you a solar eclipse that's coming up. Okay, this is coming up next year in April of next year. Take a look at what happens. This is the solar eclipse on the inside. 
in Washington, DC. Look at what it, and on the outside wheel is Amtrak. So this solar eclipse absolutely is calling Amtrak's name. The eclipse is right on Amtrak's sun and it brings their Pluto and the sixth cusp, okay, of this infrastructure bill right to the frickin' ascendant, okay? Take a look at what's happening on the descendant. Look at all this. Neptune, Venus, Jupiter, all receiving the trine, you know, the moon in Cancer and connecting with this Mars Pluto. I mean, there's just something about this that just seems so undeniably connected to this theme of flooding. And so now I have an even bigger reason to pay attention to the way that my city is interfacing with this infrastructure bill and the Amtrak expectation of how it will develop its services within New York City. So when I go to the city and talk about how the city is interfacing with Amtrak, my emphasis is going to be on flooding and it's going to be on because of what the charts are telling me and the research I've done on this theme that we need to talk about how institutional knowledge gets kept you know, within the organizing body. I might even talk about the exact issue that's happened with rail in the UK because the astrology has shown me the connection, which means it might actually um, trigger some, somebody's heartstrings somewhere, you know? Anyway, you know, that's um, my presentation. I just have like a quick ad just to say, you know, if you enjoy this kind of technique, really, it's, it's, it's good to start with a good knowledge of worry. So, you know, we're, we are opening some courses for 2022 if you're interested, but that's my presentation. I believe I have a, a little bit of time for questions. Is that right? Like eight minutes for questions? If there are any, there may not be. Yep. You have time, definitely. That was great. Okay. Are there any um, questions or thoughts? Um, Selena, have you seen Wade, oh yeah, Wade, would you like me to read them out for you? Or do you want to Were there questions? Yourself? Did I miss them? Did I miss no, them? No, not really. I mean, there's, you've kind of been quite on it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a little um, ADD, that's my issue. <laughs> no, it was perfect, it made my job easy. Um, okay, feel, well, feel you know free what? Any, oh, I was gonna say, feel free anyone now if they wanna put any questions in the, in the chat box for, for Wade. I love questions, but it also might just be that maybe this was a bit overwhelming. I mean, it is important to remember, I used to work in infrastructure, in consulting, and as a financial analyst, and as a data analyst, and I'm an astrologer. So I'm combining these things together into a technique and an approach that gives me purpose and kind of sharpens my rhetoric, okay? So it works for me. I'm not saying that every one of you, I'm encouraging you to turn around and go take a look at your city's budget unless even an ounce of you is curious, because if that's the case, then that's exactly what I'm telling you. But if you're finding yourself not curious, I would just say then turn inward and find out where your strengths lie. What are you good at? And how can you see the effects of um, clim climate change and um, around you? And where can you apply your knowledge of astrology to directly addressing in a very practical, hands-on, I am physically doing it kind of way? Because you can't manifest climate change away. You can't wish it away. It is going to require action. So on some level, you know. Um, Susan says, what I'm aiming to do is quite high level, but the rest of us can do things on a smaller scale. And I actually think that this is a smaller scale, but you have to understand also with my personality, Susan, my brain is, um, it is the type that I will suck in as much as I can to distract myself as possible. So it's also possible that all the things that I'm doing to research, you know, take a look here and there as, as much as it deeply edifies me. It's also possible that that's, you know, a symptom of procrastination from actually getting off my couch and going to physically do something. So, you know, I, I don't know that I think, you know, honestly, what's most valuable is just putting one foot in front of the other. So um, I wouldn't even say that I think that this is very small scale what I've done here. And um, you know, hopefully um, I will have at this time next year, some news for you about, you know, how the experience was. I'm going to give this a shot this year with the New York budget process. I missed it last year. So I think Wade's going to end up being an MP for his. <laughs> Do you know, I used to want to be an MP. I, I did actually, but um, you know, not anymore. Well, like I said, expert and master of many you are Wade. <laughs> so it's really good to see it at that level. Really, really good to, understand it um and also see what we can do you know what people can do some people 
you know, are good at some things and some people are good at others. So do you know what? Sometimes um can I give you just to, you know, just to the group, honestly, just attending a presentation like this, even if nothing else happens out of it, you've participated in a conversation. And you've also helped fund the ability for all of us to participate in this together. You, you know, by, by paying to attend, you've made it possible for us to meet. So even this, having the, let's go back to what Michael said. I'd like to close on what Michael said. I'd like to read that again. Here's what they said. And this was after me freaking out about this presentation. Like, is this gonna be too crazy? What should I do? Like, do you think? I think it's valuable to be generating new thinking and conversation about these ideas. And I'm confident that you will constellate these examples and questions and observations in ways that spark emergent possibilities for people listening. And that's the work, I think. There's no simple or singular conclusion to reach on the topics of astrology or climate change, and especially not in thinking them together. So instead, we're making meaning at the interface. Mm. I just think that I have to end my presentation on that point. It's just such a beautiful one. So I want to say thank you to Michael, who's you know helped keep me calm, and then also Wendy for inviting me to participate um, in this today. And I also want to thank Ryan for giving me a sneak peek into, uh, sneak peek into his research on John Quigley. That was um, such a fun little bit of goss, you know, I really like getting to talk about that kind of stuff. So anyway, um, just want to say thank you to everybody and thanks for those attending and for the comments in the chat box. And I'll just go ahead and pass it back over to you, Wendy. Thank you, Wade. That was great. Thank you so much. Excellent. Really excellent. Thank you. Well, um, nearly at the end of the day, we've got one more talk left. Um, which is going to be very exciting um, and given by Michael, who Wade was just quoting, um, and Drew, and they'll be um, coming in at quarter to four, which uh, UK time, quarter to 11, Eastern, quarter to eight, Pacific, and yeah, not... That's about the only time zones I know of my heart at the moment. I'm not going to get through all of them. Um, so, yeah, guys, grab a cup of tea, whatever you need to do. Thanks again, Wade. That was great. And I'll see you all in 15 minutes. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Thank you.